We know the Bible says the kingdom of the beast will be here. It is born out of every nation, tongue, and people. The beast is. That means a system will rise in this earth, or let's just say expand in this earth, containing all nationalities, and it will be what the Bible calls the kingdom of the beast. It's not going to be a holy kingdom. They will be in operation for some years. We know the three and a half years that is marked in the Bible as Jerusalem being trampled underfoot in the book of Revelation, or 42 months in the book of Revelation, which is three and a half years in the book of Daniel and other books are stating the exact same thing. So we know that this kingdom is going to be in power. It's going to upset Jerusalem and what they're trying to do there. So it's going to reign over the kings of the earth and the earth period. And the mark is coming out. The mark of the beast showing one's loyalty to that system of the beast. Now, instead of getting into a conversation of what the mark is, I'm not going to do that. I will tell you that this kingdom is going to rise. And when it rises, the man of perdition is going to be revealed. How? The Bible tells us how. He is the only one, right, after his negotiations, that will go into Jerusalem with an unholy alliance and trample Jerusalem underfoot 40 and two months and hold that territory. And from there, he's going to launch his tabernacles, start building these tabernacles all over the place. We know about the image of the beast also. So the image of the beast, the world is going to make. He'll convince the world to make an image to the beast, which tells you that the world is listening to this guy or this thing, whatever you want to call it. The point is, the kingdom is rising. This this dark kingdom is rising in the earth. And there's going to be no great disaster during this time. And evil will have a type of reign over the righteous. In fact, when the Bible says he's going to wear out the saints of the Most High, in the book of Daniel, it speaks about him overcoming the saints of the Most High. You can almost see in the book of Revelation and Daniel how he's going to do that. It's not that he's coming to your house to kill you. That's not what it is. Overcoming the saints of the Most High, that word overcoming in the Kenobi Greek is closely related to or described one having his way over another. So think of it this way. In your heart and in your mind, because I hear this every day, we want the world to operate in a different way. In America, for example, we want a better value system. We don't want to spend a bunch of money, but we want to take care of the people. So within that, you have a lot of people that say, well, we got to keep capitalism. Well, of course, we can operate in a socialistic environment, which is to distribute everything one makes you start laboring for the whole. It's just not set up that way. And people's mindsets are not there. That'd be like a forced labor camp. But right now, people are at odds. And there's evil on both sides of the aisle, in my view. There's a deep evil in both sides of the aisle. Number one, if anybody's out there conservative, I have more of a conservative view than anything else. I still believe in hard work. Are you kidding? A lot of people don't. They believe in uh, distributed wealth. I, I do not. I believe in hard work. And I also believe in taking care of people, which is where I differ from a lot of other folks. I'm not one who would just, you know, say, well, that person should suffer. That's what they get. I don't believe that because I believe that every day we are living, God has chosen to give us another chance. And there were He's the actual king of kings and lord of lords over all things, not any of us. But in this kingdom right now, it is legal to do some pretty horrific things in the eyes of the Lord. And you don't see protests out there saying, hey, we got to stop nudity because the Lord didn't create us that way. Hey, we have to stop this and stop that and stop that. There are no protests from Christians not saying any of that. There's no petition against television. There's no petition against certain things on the Internet. There's no petition against accountability of a person's speech. Just like the First Amendment, I'm going to show you something. With the amendments, they are declared and affirmed rights agreed upon by those in power that we should be able to express ourselves by. But take the freedom of speech for a moment. It's good to have, it's critical to have, because if you are in trouble because of some nefarious operation taking place with a corporation and they're doing you dirt and doing wrong to you, you should be able to voice that opinion to anybody you so desire. And, and in this case, you should be able to freely discuss with an attorney, freely discuss with your peers, right? Anybody. 
about what this corporation is doing so that you can get help and, 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 and potentially overturn what this corporation is doing to you in any case. But this same amendment protects another who would blaspheme the Lord our God, and that person will be touched. And it still provides a voice for the perverted people in this nation. And it still provides a voice for those who hate, say they hate a specific gender, or they desire to further corrupt the genders through some other weird way. They have freedom to express their ideologies also. So I'm telling you this because what is normally utilized as good was meant for a moral society. In other words, when um, Andy Griffith first came out, the world was very different. People had morals. There are a lot of things people wouldn't even think to do. All of a sudden in this generation, seems like everything is permissible. There's no way you can turn on any television and see something decent on any channel all day long. Doesn't matter what it is. You cannot see decency there. There's always something that will create some flesh desire within a person or totally within a person or, you know, what have you. This same freedom of expression is what the beast is going to use as an example. That's just one case to do what he's doing right now which is to set up a very dark kingdom. And the saints desire these things not to go forward. We desire that the Lord's way be established in the earth, that responsibility be established in the earth, that we be refined collectively and have the freedom to be refined. But the world wants something opposite us. They believe a person should be able to walk down the street like Adam and Eve knew. They believe that, uh, you know, church should not be able to tell someone you can't be a part of this organization because of who you are. So the world wants something totally different than what uh, the average Christian wants. The beast is utilizing these freedoms by way of perversion, and he's utilizing them freely in front of everybody, perverting everything. And it's almost like nobody can really do anything about it. Why? Because they've been granted freedom to do it. And nobody's going to take away the Bill of Rights because somebody wants to pervert the Bill of Rights or exercise some perverted way by way of the Bill of Rights. They, they're just not going to do that. The truth be told, though, the Bill of Rights was written for those with morals. Well, they separated from a monarchy so long ago, at least they had morals. Now, of course, you had bad apples in the bunch, yes, but they had morals. As we've been going on throughout these uh, decades, morality is dropping. That meter is very close to zero. No morality. And we have no morality. And your freedom of expression, your freedom of speech and what you desire to do, if that becomes corrupt and perverted and dark and murderous and you name it, those same constitutional rights support the individual that's doing these things within limitations. I'm saying this because to wear out the saints of the most high, is to utilize the roadway of peace to produce evil. Imagine a highway being built through a, a big mountain range. And at first, it makes it easy for everybody to traverse that mountain range without anybody dying and everybody's all happy. All of a sudden, drug runners find this highway and they start utilizing it to transport drugs. The highway is so vast, so long, they get away with it for a long time. People protest it and they say, no, we can't close it. We have to keep it open. And somebody may say, well, we don't know who is who. We don't know who has that. Or you're not catching enough people on this highway with the drugs. And they say, well, there's nothing we can do. And so evil always uses avenues that are built for its end goal. The beast is wearing out the saints the most high, even right now, because Christians desire these things to be held up in a moral standard, but they're not. And nobody can force anybody to hold up these rights with moral standards. And it's almost like a losing battle. We utilize those rights every single day, but we know they're being perverted. We're being taken advantage of by those very rights. And we know this, and there's nothing we can do about it. That's what it seems like right now. See, that's why if we could fix it, there'd be no need for Christ to come. If we could fix it, there'd be no need for the Father to come. He would just simply end us with the strength and the wisdom to do it. That's not how it's going to work. He shall return himself. And this earth is going to experience or, or be a spectacle for all creation because God the Father is coming here to this place. That will be preceded by many things. But it also means that you're going to have to endure like you've been enduring. Right now you've been enduring these corrupt and perverse ways on the earth that really do assault you. 
to your bone. They are grotesque in nature, perverse. They are against Christ. We all know this. They speak about every single deity out there, but they don't speak about Jesus Christ. Have you noticed? They have statues to everything out there. You see Buddha at the UN, Shiva at the UN, the bulls at the UN, the plights at the UN. You see all these things at the UN, at CERN, at other, you know, these, these, uh, NASA, JPL, their iconography represents Apollo. You see all this stuff all over the world. And only we represent Christ. Nobody else does. And they try to suppress that voice of Christ. They've taken down things that were at the White House. It used to represent Christ. They're gone. They're not there. You remember the time when they said, well, we, you know, we can't have everybody saying Merry Christmas because it's offensive. You got to say, you know, some weird thing. You can't say Merry Christmas because that's offensive. This is how the beast is walking forward. Now, if the Bible says that this thing is going to reign, what we know for at least three and a half years, we know at least three and a half years he's going to reign. And there's nothing the saints can do to stop it. Then we're experiencing a portion of that right now, him wearing out of the saints most high, just like certain policies are against Christianity. See, just like the corporate world is causing churches and organizations that need money to be oppressed because of what they're getting away with, and the penalty comes upon nonprofits. It's been some pretty twisted things involved in nonprofits, and uh, because of them, the news is tight. So when they go out there and purposely do slick things and mess these things up, we're paying the penalty. Because you're moral and upright, you're not looking for loopholes. They are. They know all the loopholes. Christians don't walk around looking for loopholes, but the other guys too. And so when it says he will wear out the saints the most high, he will overcome the saints the most high, clearly that's him establishing his way and that kingdom's way above what we desire the most that the principles of the kingdom be established in the earth. And right after his reign, because it is Christ who will end his reign, his kingdom will be thrust into darkness. Right after this reign, then they feel the punishment of what they have done. Then they see what they have been a part of. But for right now, how many of you are you just, you're up to your top of your head with disgust with how things are going in the world? Surely you can't be happy with it. We get small reprieves, but you can't be happy with it. It's almost like evil is starting to dominate things. Now, listen to me. This is very important because during this time, Jesus gave a warning and a hint. Do you know that? He gave that revelation. He gave a warning and a hint. During the time, the beast would have a voice speaking great things and blasphemies. He gave us a hint. You know what he said? He that leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He that kills with the sword will be killed with the sword. In other words, whatever tactic you start utilizing that is not born of the living God, you will die by. If you start doing what the world is doing, it's going to take you. It's going to consume you. It's going to kill you. Have you noticed that though the kingdom of the beast, he's taking care of the people so much so that when the two witnesses are lying dead in the streets, what do they do? They start giving each other presents. Hey, I bought your Lamborghini. These uh, two people who suppressed our wonderful free way of life, they're done. You know, the ones that stood up in the streets of Jerusalem telling us that we're immoral, that we can't have this policy and we shouldn't do this. And they were causing the skies to change. And if they're dead, we're free. We can live like we want to, like we did back in the 2021s. That's what they'll do. Start giving presents to each other. Then the two witnesses don't come back to punish them, but they're called up to God in front of their eyes. Then everything falls apart when they're called up to God. It's over, right? Those two witnesses were there to give them a warning, to demonstrate a warning that your ways are corrupt. Listen, when you have people that are not born and raised with Christ in mind, there has to be a physical example in front of them because they're not born with the seed of faith you are. They were given a physical example. Let me tell you how bad it is. If God has to demonstrate, he's, he always demonstrates to a people who are at the height of immorality, who are at the edge of being irredeemable. If he has to show something, and he's not doing it by faith, but in fact, he's demonstrating, that's a last call all during this time. You can read it in Revelation now. Not every saint's going to be there. They're not going to witness all this stuff. Some of you, you may not be there. I know for a fact that some of you won't be there. But there's some young ones out there. There's some roughnecks out there that love the Lord. And they might be there. They might witness it. 
But those are going to have to be the ones who stay during the time where people receive the mark. are going to have to be those who don't bend to anything. We're talking about wild men. We're talking about people who can live out in the woods outside of society and still function as upright vessels. We're not talking about those who need to go to the store every day. Because we know during the time of the mark, people are not going to the store. But nevertheless, some of the rebellion against law enforcement, of course, a lot of people don't know what law enforcement is for. And there's some bad apples everywhere. But I tend to look at things at both sides and never one-sided. People are going to find out what it is to be without protection. The reason being is because conditions here on our top side are going to be a bit challenging. And all those individuals who have lived basically somewhat separated from large city society, things like that, they're going to be very valuable in the days ahead. Now, folks, I want to continue this talk about the beast kingdom rising, right? There's a massive responsibility for all of us who believe in Christ. We have a massive responsibility more now than ever before, even in the face of, well, let's say a type of inclusiveness that the world is going to have. And this is what you have to watch out for. Every single last one of us, we know what it is to be rejected. We know what that is. Nobody wants to be left out, feel like they're on the outside. The Lord's just not going to throw us into a situation he never does. He always foreshadows every big situation with real life experiences. Do you know what's happening right now in most people's lives? Through these political tensions, Many of you have experienced what it is to be on one side or the other. You've also experienced real fear of opposition to what you believe in. Take, for example, the vaccine conversation. That pops up and all of a sudden people start taking sides for or against it. And what they do is they dovetail reasons, not from what they know themselves, but from what the majority has said. A lot of people believe the vaccine is doing damage to people, this, that, and the other, which it will. The, all vaccines, medicines for, in fact, aspirin kills more people than vaccines everywhere. That's the truth, aspirins. But when we see things on television, when we see people talking about things, we have a tendency to believe what they're talking about without knowing all the facts ourselves, especially, in fact, you cannot know because it's not like any of us can break COVID-19 down in a lab and see how it truly binds and what can truly kill it, right? So we don't know those things, but we do trust those in our circles. This is very important, not necessarily an expert, because in these days, you can have all the credentials to be an expert. That does not mean you're going to be believed. If you're on the right side saying the right thing with the credentials, people may believe you. If you're on the wrong side with the right credentials, even with the facts, you may not be believed. Period. So people are believing the majority. This is where you have to be careful because the majority is going to end up siding with things that are wrong. These are the days when wrong is right, right is wrong. These are those days when what people think is right. And I'm one of those I will never agree with anybody in the world. I'll never do it because the Lord said that the world hates him. It sought to kill him. I'm not going to listen to the world, which is anybody outside the blood of the Lamb and truth. I don't care what their expertise is. I'm not going to make decisions based upon what they believe, because what they believe is laden by a natural disdain for Christ, a disdain they don't even know about. We don't belong to the world. We've been called out of the world. There's no way the world's going to give me advice on anything, and I'm going to follow it. There's just no way. I don't Jimmy crack corn. I don't care what anybody thinks, because I tend to do what I do out of the heart for everybody else. That's what I do. I put myself at risk plenty of times in my life for the sake of somebody else. Just like some of these people, instead of walking off their jobs, they say, you know, it's time that somebody take a hit for the sake of somebody else. There's no way if you were a peacekeeper of your neighborhood and you, everybody in your neighborhood and somebody comes up and says, well, you know, if you don't do so and so, you're going to be fired. And then whatever they ask you to do is it's not like it's a, you know, it's going to separate your relationship to the Lord or something like that. But indeed, it could kill you. I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to protect those people. I'm not giving up my seat. I'm not going to leave somebody in a stranger's hands. Right? I'm not going to do that. So ultimately, I don't listen to the world. I go and pray about things. I'm telling you right now, folks, I'm not going to do it. So I'm one of those. The world can go right and say, hey, if you don't go right, you're going to die. I say, oh, well, I'll just die in your opinion. But the Lord can only put that death sentence on me. Nobody else can. In fact, you're not going to go anywhere until the Lord says you can go somewhere. But there are too many people. Christians have to be careful now. What, what most Christians are doing right now is we're getting caught up in this popularity thing. We've all been rejected. We all have some sort of a residue from rejection 
rejection and nobody wants to be rejected. You got to get to the point where you're, you're thinking about your relationship with Christ. He's the only one that I'm truly concerned about rejecting me. I'm not worried about people rejecting me. And I'm telling you right now, before these greater situations comes, the Lord puts you in a foreshadowing of that same event. And right now you're inside of an event. You're inside of it now and it's going to be tested. Imagine you being around all your friends, all your, all the people you care about. Not all of them are Christian, of course. And then, but you have to make a decision or a conversation comes up. They look directly at you and they say the famous words, well, don't you agree with us? That's precisely how spirits talk. That's how they talk through people. They'll bring up some weird conversation, look you dead in the eye and say, don't you agree with us? Now, if you say no, you know, you're going to be ousted. How many of you would side with Christ? No matter what they thought how many of you would do that see I, I do that with my own family i do it with friends and, and there's some friends just walk away if you agree with the morals of christ they will walk away and they won't come back and it's no problem for me to agree with christ because i'll tell you something anybody who is truly my brother or sister is an eternal brother or sister right if they're not eternal then they're not my brothers and sisters here either they have a potential to be but they're choosing something else so in the end I'm not going to be with them. But most importantly, I need to listen to Christ in all things. Listen to me. I've experienced with this. I've experienced with making a decision based on sound data, sound advice, sound everything. And it was absolutely the wrong decision. Just because the mathematics may say it's the right thing to do. Just because those experts in the world say it's the right thing to do. Just because the leading parties say it's the right thing to do does not mean it's the right thing to do. Because my standard set does not come from the earth. It does not come from the world. In fact, we were told to come out of that stuff and enter into the kingdom of God. And to begin to instill his standards within ourselves to express to the world who would naturally be against anything you chose of the living God. If the world agrees with you, you've got a problem. The Lord gave us a foreshadowing and a warning of this too. He said, if all people run to you, you know, speaking all manner of good for you, so did they to the false prophets that came before you. You know what that means? The world's not going to think highly of you when you choose to follow Christ. Here's the bad part. We all know when we have compromised what we truly believe and we follow the world so we would not be rejected. We all know this. We all know that the bottom line for us is to try not be rejected. All of us know this. And these are the days we have to, you know, if you're going to choose Christ, choose him all the way. Because if you don't believe you're going to be tried by it, that's contrary to the word of God. God said he would try you. He will never tempt, but he will try you. If you say something out of your mouth, Lord, I love you no matter what, you better believe that's going to be qualified. Because if it's not qualified, you spoke in hypocrisy. And hypocrisies go where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. If you boast about something, you better believe it's going to be tried and tested here on earth. Because if you boast about something, but in fact, it is not proven, that's hypocrisy. It must come from the inside and the outside. It must match or it's hypocrisy. That means... These tests, these situations you find yourself in. First of all, since pandemic, how many of you found yourself in a, one of those weird predicaments drawn between two sides where you had to choose which one you were going to agree with, knowing that if you agree with one, you're going to lose the other. How many found themselves in that predicament? I know it's been happening to you on many different levels. I know it's been happening. Here's why. And don't take that for granted either. Don't think it's an aggravation either. Because one day the mark is going to be here on this earth. Now, in Revelation already tells us nobody written in the book of life is going to take the mark. Everybody else will. They're going to be able to buy and sell. They're going to be able to spend their money, right? They're going to be able to enjoy their cars and have a license. Haven't you understood that all identification is going into one system right now? All of it. Don't you understand through cyber crimes and everything else? Biometrics is already in place. They just need to implement it. It is not a matter of what you like or dislike. It's going to be mandatory. People are going to ask for these things. They're going to say, hey, we don't need these bank cards. We need something where nobody else can hack it. And when they start messing with you, when you look on your account, your account is zero. You're going to say, hey, we need more secure banks. We need a way that if, if it's not me, nobody should be able to touch my bank account. What about the people that get their mortgages or not mortgages, but their deeds stolen from them? They want true verification. You know how many people right now do things in other people's names? All they need is your name and your address and they can steal your entire identity. They don't need your social security number. They don't need your date of birth. They just need your name and your address. You know how many people had their homes sold from under them? Can you imagine a person coming to 
your home and they said, well, this home was sold two years ago. What are you doing here? But it's your home. You paid it off. You have the deed, you thought. But somebody else came and stole your home by way of paperwork, sold it to somebody else, and now you've got to move. The police are not going to back you up. They're going to back up the paperwork. They're not going to believe your story. And you've got to go to court. That could take years to prove that you didn't sell the house because anybody has access to your deed by way of a courthouse. Do you know that? That happened to so many people, it's not even funny. You know, this world is full of crime, full of dirty, little dirty crimes. People do things you wouldn't even conceive of. See, in your mind, you say, well, why would anybody do that? That's just awful. Well, that's the world. The same world that advises you how to live your life. Yeah, that world. The world that a lot of Christians follow, unfortunately. That world. The Lord is foreshadowing the bigger things with these small things. Don't take anything for granted in your life. You got to realize something. If you have accepted Christ, there is nothing in your life that will ever take place unless God approves it directly. You're bought with a price. You're not left to chance. Don't you know that? Everything that's happening in your life is for the refinement and growth of your spirit, refinement of your soul. You're being saved. You're being redeemed. That's why the Bible says, he that endures until the end, the same shall be saved. That person who endures until the very end of the race, that person is going to be saved. Well, what happens if you just give up in the middle? You will not be saved. In the New Testament, it says, when you see enemies encamped around Jerusalem, look up for your redemption draweth nigh. It didn't say your redemption was, well, you already had it. That's not what it said. You're marked to be saved. You're marked to be redeemed. You're in the process of being saved and redeemed, but you're not fully saved until you stand with Jesus. You have to finish your race here. And this is a process. And nothing in your life is left a chance. You're bought with a price. Nothing in your life is left a chance. You got to know that. If you're not careful, you're going to be taught differently. And a lot of people believe, well, if I was saved 10 years ago, then I'm saved for life. No, this is a process or else it would never be written in there. Don't deceive yourselves. It will never be written in there about that evil servant who says in his heart, my Lord delayeth his coming and begins to smite his fellow servants. It never said he was doing it the whole time. He said, if it gets into your heart that the Lord's not coming back for a long time, you start doing things the worldly way. So all this talk about giving yourselves time, well, I got time to do this. What you do is you open up a can of worms you can't really close. And anytime, if you think really hard, you don't have to say, yep, that's right, or uh, uh, I didn't do that. Anytime you have thought in your mind that the Lord wasn't coming for another 50 or 60 years, instantly you start to plant your feet in the world. Have you noticed? But when you start thinking about the Lord coming back, you start straightening things up. It's kind of like being on a phone, right? When you're on the phone with somebody you like, you start doing things in your house to clean up, getting ready to see that person. You get on the phone with somebody you don't like. You stop the preparations. You're trying every excuse in the book to get that person off the phone. Isn't that correct? Well, the same thing happens when you're thinking about Christ coming at any moment. I know a lot of people, they like that idea of the Lord coming back to get us. But let me, let me plant the seed. The Lord's not coming back for everybody. He's coming back for a glorious church without spot or wrinkle. If you're not part of that glorious church, now, a glorious church without spot or wrinkle, that's the church he prepares through a process. He gets out all the spots and all the wrinkles. But what if you interrupt it? Your own thing is if, well, I'm, I'm good enough. The Lord will forgive me anyway. Don't we have these sayings? He'll forgive me anyway. Even if I do it, he'll forgive me anyway. Why would God give you conviction before you ever do something and then you sit up there and say he's going to forgive me anyway? These are ways within ourselves we're given time to purge. It's time for self-reflection. The Bible tells us to purge yourself before the Lord comes. We're also to hide ourselves in the Lord. You know what that means, to hide yourself in the Lord? It doesn't mean go up under a rock and hide. That's not what that means. To hide yourself in the Lord is to stand within his standards. To stand within him is to be hidden from the world. Do you know that? Because they won't be able to see what you're doing. They can't recognize what you're doing. If they recognize you too much, then you're familiar with them. And if you're familiar with them, how in the world did you get out of the world? Come out of her, my people, and be not partakers of her sins, that you won't partake of her plagues. So everybody who continues in the standard of this world is going to pay the price the world pays. Those who come out of the world, meaning those who cast aside various ways of the world for the sake of the Messiah, will not partake of the judgment of this world. They will not partake. In fact, 
God's children are not appointed to his wrath, nor will they face the judgment of this world because they have a true advocate. And when you should be judged because you chose Christ in all aspects of your life, you have an advocate who paid the price for you. That gives you a free pass right into eternity. Why? Because you kept the faith here. And what I'm telling you is this. The foreshadowing of the beast's kingdom is already here. The problem is we refuse to see it because it's inconvenient to us. That's what I'm saying. Somebody gives you a job offer of a lifetime that you've been training for all your life, and all of a sudden you say, no, 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 no. They want me to do what? And they have something in there that your Lord gave you great conviction of. To you, that's going to be a sin. So then a person who's truly following Christ would say, no, I'm not doing that. I'm not going to compromise the standards of my Lord that I know how to keep for any amount of money. I'm not doing that. A lot of people are compromising, jumping on the bandwagon. Why? Because they're frightened of rejection. They don't want to be the odd one out. Many of you were born that way, the odd one out. Many of you, all you want is to be accepted by your family. And for some reason, you can't. There's always something. And you don't understand it. I understand it. The Lord is not going to lose you. He does not want to lose you. So he marked you from birth. He doesn't want to lose you. But the truth is, we have been compromising on many different levels. And as the earth intensifies in its activity, that's directly proportional to the timing of the Lord coming here to redeem his children in full. That means our purgings must truly begin. Why do you think he put all of us together? Why do you think he draws one person to another? Because this church is unified of many members. And of those members, there's strength among the brethren. That's why I said, forsake not the assembly of yourselves. Why? Because it's good to be around fellow believers so that you can recharge, so that you can be encouraged. So that when you have those hard days as a believer, that's still going to have that faith. It's good to know who the strong ones in faith are, who the strong ones in prayer are. Because when you find it challenging, God has already answered the prayer of giving you strength through your brethren. We just have to utilize it. We just have to see it the Lord's way. And stop trying to look at the Bible with the tool set of the world who tends to interpret all of what we hold close, the scriptures. They try to interpret the scriptures. And Satan will try to make you void the scriptures. He wants you not to believe in them. Do you not know that if the Lord blessed you with a person in your life, and you didn't know it was a blessing, you're going to tell that person to get out. The Lord's not going to give you something that will cause you to go backwards. He's going to give you something that will cause you to go forward, that will complement your walk with him. So he's not going to give you a person that's going to agree with you relaxing. They won't agree with your whatever ideas you have about the world and how you're going to be king of the world. They won't agree with that. They're going to disagree with it. They will exercise your patience, won't they? Patience is a virtue required of the Lord in all things we do. So keeping that in mind, the person he sends could very well get on your nerves. The person he sends could very well know you so well that they would irritate you to pieces. The person he sends would have you exercise self-discipline. They would know every area of waste in your life. See, that doesn't describe the blessing most people think about. Well, I want someone who compliments me. Absolutely. You know what that really means? I need somebody that will agree with me, not fight against me. The Lord's not sending anybody like that unless you're perfect in all of what you do. I know I'm not perfect in all of what I do. But see, we can't see that all the time, can we? Do you see now with a true blessing how we cannot see it? Think of the apostles coming around telling people, better get your life right. The Lord is coming. And here's how you get, oh, get out of here. They couldn't even perceive that blessing. That was a blessing. That's what that was. They don't want to deal with it. When the Lord told that rich man, you, you go and sell all you had to the poor and come follow me. That was a blessing. He couldn't see it. When the Lord told that parable, he said, come follow me. And the guy said, well, you know, I got cattle I got to feed. Well, yeah, I still have half the farm I got to do. You know, and all these people gave excuses. They squandered their blessing. A blessing was right before them. They couldn't see it. The Pharisees had a blessing right before them. They couldn't see it. They had the son of the living God right before them. They couldn't see it. Here it is. You ready? Because they believed in their own paradigm. They believed they figured it out. They believed that their way was the truth. That's where they messed up. See, once you think you have the truth, you become the expert, the master of your own environment. And you become blind in doing so. Well, we figured out we couldn't see certain blessings when they did come. Because we thought it was a curse. In fact, it was a blessing. There have been losses in your life that were a blessing. You thought it was the end of the world. We know that too. Because had that thing stayed in your life, it would have drug you right into the world. You could have been prosperous in the world, soulless right now to this very day. How many of you are really wise that you found out that the highest spiritual states you have ever had were during times of great disparities? 
when everything was crashing in on you, when things looked bleak, that's when you experienced the highest points of the Spirit. How many know that? How many of you missed that? Some of you, you've had the opposite side. You've had the wealth and everything else, and you know how spiritually dead you were, and you're not going back to it. That's the reason why you're not going back to it. You don't want to go back to it because you know there's an emptiness there. The, the, the body and the mind, logical mind, will say, hey, that, that's it. That's where you want to be. That's what you think because you're not there yet. And once you get there, I'll be the first one to tell you, you're going to be on guard 24-7. Let me see if I'm right here. Those of you, suppose you have lots of money. Tell me I'm wrong, but you don't have to check on that money to make sure it didn't disappear, to make sure your investments and IRAs and all this other stuff didn't, you know, something didn't happen to it. You, you have to really babysit that money. It requires your attention no matter who you are and what you're doing. How many of you know that? It'll have you become a slave to it. And you'll spend the rest of your life trying to keep your wealth. You'll be wealthy, but then the most of your labors are going to be worrying over that wealth. Those who don't have money at all, who barely have enough, they think they want wealth. They don't even know they're free. They don't have to deal with the headaches and the spirit that comes with a lot of money. And that 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 feeling you get. One time I was in, a, it's, what was this, back in, in the 80s. And I was sitting there watching the ticker tape. And this is when I was you know, just starting to turn stuff into things that actually were real. And you start doing these trades and then you start adding up the fees and kind of get used to that. And you're watching what falls. And every day drew me. And, and during the daytime, I was in the service too. So, you know, I had somehow I had to check on the money. I had to make sure the trades were right for the rest of the day and beat everything before the closing bell. Weekends were horrible because you you were like thinking, you know, you're watching news, trying to track everything, trying to find out what everybody's going to do on Monday, trying to beat the market. You'll become a slave to it unless the Lord does. You do it, you become a slave to it. If the Lord does it, it's only going to be a tool. But there's a spirit that comes with this stuff. Now, when you don't have a lot of money, anything else, and you're kind of struggling, even if you have a family, doesn't it make it precious those times when you have very little? You have the most enjoyable times with family during those hardships. In fact, for families, it is those very hardships that forge a bond in a family that can never be broken. And it's true. It's true. Those hardships with other folks, it forges a bond. That's with any group. When they go through something together, they become closer than brothers and sisters. They go to a whole new level of everything. When they face things together, go through things together, and they end up telling the other person, hey, I got your back. It's rough, but we can make it. When everybody's hungry, when everybody's tired, when everybody's on the edge, and you say, you know what, we can make it. And you stick it out. But then you create the most memorable moments. That's a blessing. Wouldn't it be a gap in your life that will be an actual blessing that we can't even see? Here's my point. All too often, we don't see the blessings from the living God because they're not what we're looking for. If God sent us a blessing in the first place, I don't want a blessing that I can conjure up. I don't want that. I need something above what I'm able to think. I don't want what I can think. I don't want what I think will make me happy or think will give me joy or think will fix the problem. I don't want that stuff because I don't want that stuff anymore. I used to. I used to be the expert on my own life. You ever try to help someone and they say, oh, I got this problem. You start talking to them. They don't want your advice. They just wanted to tell you what the problem was to get you to agree with them somehow. They didn't want your solution. They become the best experts on their lives, but they're miserable. Surely you know somebody like that. Anyway, my point is, all too often we can't identify a blessing. But why? It's because in truth, we want what we think will fix our lives, and that's what we go after. But if God is able to do above and beyond what we're able to ask or think, then what he will do for us has never entered into our minds. And if that is the case, you're not going to see your blessing. Not the way you think is coming. He's going to do something beyond what you're able to ask or think. So what does that mean then? How do you receive a blessing? You have to be prepared for it. You single people out there, listen to me carefully. In most cases, people go out and get their own partner. They don't wait for the Lord. They say, ooh, that one likes me. Let's get together and we're married, right? So that's how it works. But if you're prepared by the Lord, your life, you're going to go through these places in life that you're totally out of control. You're not controlling. You're not controlling your direction or anything else. During those times, though, you're educated. You're given experience. Your wisdom is gained during those times. And what is the Lord doing? He's preparing you and he's preparing somebody else at the same time. And he put your crossroads together. That's what happens when he puts two people together. He will prepare you one for another. Most of us can admit that in most cases, we were not properly prepared to have somebody else. 
When the Lord blesses you, he'll prepare you to receive it because his blessings will alter your life and the lives of those around you. That's what his blessings will do. When we bless ourselves, we just go into debt. We just create chaos and problems where it falls apart some years later. If the Lord blesses you, it's not going to fall apart years later. Listen, because of this time when people are going home, don't be so downcast and countless because of them. Understand they have labored in this world. And the Lord saw fit for them to stand before him. You know, in the Bible, when it says, pray that you escape all these things and stand before the Son of Man, you're only going to stand before him having completed what you've been sent here to complete. So finish your race. Then you go home. Or should I say, then you're born. But everything is foreshadowed. Right now, it's time for us. Not choosing what we think is the Lord, but actually choosing the Lord in all things. Now, why is that? The infiltrators are coming. The direct opposite of your spirit of love is manifesting in this earth. An equal measure of darkness. The Bible calls it a gross darkness. Events and manifestations will be on this earth that no one counted on. But God made a promise regarding his children. They are not to be touched. Not one hair on your head is to be destroyed. That's what he said. That's exactly what he meant. But even that means something. Which means our concentration should be where? Where should it be? In the race. And Jesus warned us also. He said, look, you know, there are going to be people working great signs and wonders, he said. He didn't just say signs and wonders. Great signs and wonders. Many of us will be blown away to see somebody raised from the dead. But he said great signs and wonders. So much so that if it were possible, even the very elect would be deceived. That's what he said. That's a statement in the Bible that's so difficult to swallow that Jesus is going to be that bad. That demonstration that's coming forward is going to be that bad that if it were not for Christ, even the very elect, the ones with the most faith, the most ones with, a, with all the servitude, those who won't bend to anything, even they would be deceived if it were not for Christ. That means left on their own, they would buy it hook, line, and sinker. But he's going to intervene, which means we have no power. We don't have a discernment that high to say it's a trick or it's false. That's not what people are going to be saying. Jesus tells us that if not for him, we'd fall for it. Everybody would fall for it. Just so you know, that's awful. If he has to directly intervene, even the very elect are done for? Do you understand how awful that is? That's telling us something. Because if he intervenes for the elect, which he will, the world, they don't have a chance. Just like now, some of you guys trying to talk sense into your family members, they're not listening to you, are they? And we're talking about, they won't believe you over man's things. What are they going to do during these supernatural times? But folks, prepare yourselves. God foreshadows all things. We know a very dark time is coming, but it does not have to be dark to you. We know it rains upon the just as well as the unjust, but I'm telling you, it does not have to be dark for you. There is a secret place within the most high that must be fully understood, and it will be, before the physical opposition arises. The army is out there. The draconian system has been established, but the king of that draconian system has not stepped forward yet. He will be revealed to the entirety of God's people, and that time is closer than we think. Even before he declares himself, there are some things we have to endure. In the meanwhile, remember who you are and whose you are. Let's come out of the world. Encourage each other to continue to come out of the world with sound doctrine. Let's not be any of the ones that reject sound doctrine, but be the ones who accept it. You already know you're different. And for all these years, you did a lot of things due to a fear of rejection. Don't be afraid of rejection because you're not rejected by your true family. You're not rejected by your Messiah, by your Father in heaven. So when your heart is there, the world won't affect you that way. The Lord has been strengthening many of you so that you would not collapse during the rougher things that come.